Hello, everyone, and welcome to 15 Questions with an Archaeologist, brought to you by the National Park Service Southeast Archaeological Center. I'm Josh Guerrero, and I'm your host, and this is the show where we're trying to collect as many interviews as we can, where we ask 15 questions with an archaeologist. Each podcast episode will feature one archaeologist answering the same 15 questions. I think it's going to be fun, and we just might learn something. And today, I'm joined by Dr. Ann Robb, who is currently working at Longview Community College. So, Dr. Robb, thanks so much for taking the time for joining me today, and welcome to the show. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, and I've um, been looking forward to having you on. Uh, one thing that I always try to do with this podcast is, you know, I try to interact with archaeologists from... Uh, you know, all over, um, either here in the U.S. or abroad, just to get different specialties and also those who have a lot of experience in, of course, different parts of the world. And I think you're probably the first archaeologist that we've had in the podcast that operates uh, in the, the Midwest. I believe you're uh, based in uh, Missouri. Is that correct? I am, yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm certainly looking forward to hearing about your experiences. So kicking this off, uh, our first question, just getting to try to learn a little bit more about you, you know, what is it that you do over at Longview uh, Community College? Uh, well, I, uh, first and foremost, I'm a professor. Um, and so I teach five classes a semester. Oh, wow. And then I also teach some in the summer. Um, and that's just at Longview. I, I still teach um, online at a couple of other local colleges, just, just here and there, some courses that I've been doing for a while. And um, so some semesters I'm teaching eight or nine classes. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> several of them online, several of them online. But, um, but yeah, so that is, that is primarily what I, what I do there. Um, and it's, it's been an interesting, it's been an interesting uh, kind of a, a shift with teaching in, in this environment because it's, it was a community college, right? And so there is no, um, there's no archeology span program per se. Um, we have a few courses on the books that are anthropology, you know, um, headed courses. And they're mostly taking them to meet a gen ed requirement. Um, some of them are planning to go on. Um, some of them, after taking the classes, decide they want to go on um, and major in anthropology in, in some form. So um, it's, it's inter interesting trying to hit the right balance, and I think a lot of community college professors um, struggle with this, of really laying a good foundation for people who are going to go on in the field in the discipline um, and need that foundation, but at the same time understanding that the overwhelming majority of people taking the classes are only taking it to fill, fulfill a requirement. So like what are the, what are the key ideas that a, like a human being would need to take from anthropology to use anywhere? And I've, I've actually enjoyed that part of it a lot. So it, it sounds like, more, did, so overall, though, you would say that the predominant shift is for those gen ed requirements. But now for the students that you do have, uh, do they, I guess, maybe express it up front that says, yes, I want to pursue archaeology like uh, a, as a discipline. And are you able to kind of cultivate that when they bring it forth? Yeah, I do have some um, for sure who come in and say, yeah, I want to be an archaeologist. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, it's been it's been fun since I do work. Uh, locally. I mean, the work that I do archaeologically is in Missouri. And so um, it helps me a lot with those students to be able to then have them access resources either directly through me or other people that I know in the region so that they kind of have some, some good contact with it. Um, and then others kind of at the end of the class say, oh my gosh, I never thought about archaeology, but now I want to be an archaeologist. And so then I can help them with that as well. And I think that's uh, kind of the backstory for many archaeologists that I've had the pleasure to um, interact and work with in the past is it wasn't something that they had thought about before, but once they get that initial exposure, it sets them down that path to, you know, working a long and fulfilling career. <laughs> yeah, it, it kind of draws you in once you get in there. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, moving on to um, our next question. Of course, as you mentioned, you are conducting archaeology uh, there in the Midwest uh, in and around uh, Missouri. And it makes me curious to ask you this next question. And that is, if money were no object whatsoever, what type of archaeology would you do? Would you continue on operating uh, in Missouri as you are now? Or might you go look and pursuing something different? You know, that's an interesting question. I thought about it. Um, there's and I think there's two parts to that answer for me. If money were, were no object, um, 
there is some archaeological work that I would do just for me that's personally fulfilling um, where like I don't have to be in charge of it. I don't have to write the report afterward. You know, I can just kind of be a shovel bum right. and attach myself to somebody else's project and just have fun <laughs> digging. Um, and so um, if I could do that, I would uh, probably focus on Bronze Age Ireland. I love those um, transitional phases anyway. Um, but that would just kind of be my hobby archaeology. Honestly, I would still work here in Missouri. I think there's some amazing archaeology that can be done. Um, I think archaeology in Missouri is, is very underfunded. Um, so if I could just operate without um, funding constraints, man, I would set up an ongoing field school and just really make it a serious kind of going concern here in, in Missouri because I think there's a lot there. All right. Outstanding. All right. So as of right now, we have mentioned that you are currently you know, te teaching and instructing at Longview there, but I kind of want to ask you a little bit about your own uh, educational endeavors. Uh, where have you received your education and why did you choose to study at the location or maybe perhaps it was a couple of locations that you had studied at? Right. Um, my educational path in archaeology is a little um, non-traditional in that I did not start out um, to study anthropology or archaeology. My undergrad um, was at a, a small private college in Kansas City called Avila um, College. It's now Avila University, but it was Avila College then. Um, and my undergrad uh, was in theater. And I was going to be a high school drama teacher. <clears throat> um, ironically, though, I had always wanted to be an archaeologist since I was a little kid, like I always wanted to be an archeologist, but I didn't think it was practical. So, you know, I majored in theater instead. That's um, funny right there, but, um, <laughs> but I never really kind of lost that desire um, to be in archeology span and also to, to teach. I mean, teaching is kind of the, the one through point in my entire career. So after I graduated from, from Avila, um, I realized after doing a year of um, kind of student teaching type stuff in a junior high, that there was no way that I was going to be a high school drama teacher. <laughs> that pretty much cured me of that. Um, so I kind of foundered a little bit. I had a, a daughter at the time, and so um, I needed to focus on her. And so I, I worked for a while, and I ended up in corporate training. I moved to California, actually, the Los Angeles area. Um, did corporate training, and then I got involved in improv comedy. Um, and my first husband and I, once when I married him, he was running a, an improv comedy group in Santa Barbara, California. Um, and I was helping him run that group. One of our performers, actually, was Andrew Kinkella, um, who you interviewed last month. Yes. Uh, uh huh. <laughs> and so he, he was actually one of our performers. Yeah, I, I was kind of starting to maybe put some ties together here. <laughs> <laughs> kind of linking that, yeah, right. Um, and so, but the thing that I, I really kept doing, no matter what, was I was always reading about archaeology and, um, you, you know, um, paleo um, archaeology, paleoanthropology. And during drives to and from rehearsal and performances, I would chat with Andrew, and this is when he was a, a student for his MA at Cal State Northridge. And by this time, my daughter was in junior high, so I kind of had a little bit more freedom to uh, go back to, to what I might want to do. Um, and it was, I remember having one conversation with Andrew where we were talking about some article that I had read, and he stopped. He's like, well, you, you know more about this than I do, and I'm going to school for it. You should just go back to school. Um, and so he kind of convinced me to, to go to Cal State Northridge. And so that's actually where I went for my, my master's program was Cal State Northridge. Um, and it was a great program. It was a, it's a terminal master's program. So um, you'd have to go somewhere else for your PhD. But one of the things I really liked about that program was a very strong four fields program. Um, so you got exposure to all four fields of anthropology, a really good foundation. I had never taken a single anthropology course. Um, I had to take like 15 hours at a community college in, in LA um, to kind of get classified as a master's student. 
Um, but it, it was an excellent foundation. I, I think it was the, the number one kind of, uh, kind of critical piece of my education. Um, even though I have a PhD, I, I think that MA at Cal State Northridge was, was really important. Um, and I was able to work it around my, um, my full-time job. I was doing corporate training. I was the corporate trainer at Warner Brothers Studios. Like I had to work during the day. And so oh, wow. this allowed me the flexibility to, to do that in my, in my evenings. And um, from there, then um, I ended up getting my PhD at the University of Kansas. And that's because I had already decided to move back to Missouri. The work that I really wanted to focus on was in this area um, and it was the, the best place for me to pursue my, my PhD. Um, it's an R1 institution, well-respected, you know, anthropology program. Um, and so that's why I ended up at KU. All right. Well, what I really like about uh, this story, Dr. Robbins, well, I certainly relate to it too, because I also had um, a different uh, undergrad education. Um, I studied elementary education at first, got my Uh bachelor's in that, and eventually found my way into archaeology for my master's. But I think for it just kind of goes to show that it's never too late to pursue this type of uh, career field if you so want. Um, I think maybe some right. people have the idea it's like you have to start all the way from the very beginning to like work your way uh, mm-hmm. forward because I was actually 30 when I started my uh, archaeology master's program. Didn't know a single thing about what <laughs> I was doing. So I was kind of uh, just, you know, throwing myself right into the fire, <laughs> if, if you right. will. But it, it's just, and, and again, just going back to what we had mentioned earlier, it's that it's not always the Seldomly is it the same linear like path that a lot of people would think of with when it comes right. to archaeologists. It's sometimes bouncing around through the pinball map a little <laughs> bit before you actually uh, find uh, find your calling. <laughs> right, and I was I was about thirty when I started, or when I um, uh, yeah, about thirty when I started my my master's program too. And the thing for me with the master's program is I wasn't sure what I was going to, I wasn't sure I was going to get my PhD. I wasn't sure it was going to end up leading to a a complete career change. But the thing I kept thinking to myself was, you know, if I go and I finish this, at least I won't be able to look back later and think, what if I had? Right. You know? Absolutely. All right. Very good. Well, now fast forwarding um, a little bit, uh, I want to kind of dial in on some of the work that you've been doing. And can you kind of tell us about some of uh, the most interesting sites that you've gotten to work on so far? Wow. Um, well, they're all interesting, of course. But right. um, some of the ones that I've, I've had a pleasure working with, um, I was able to work um, just a little bit, um, but do a little bit of work out at um, San Clemente Island. Um, which is, um, you know, an early peopling site. Um, it's a naval island out there, and so you kind of have to get permission to fly the plane out there. And um, so I was able to go out there and do a little bit of work, and that site goes back thousands of years, an uh, early contact, and um, really fascinating site. Uh, where, um, where, where is it situated at? Um, it is, uh, it's a coastal uh, California Oh, okay. Um, so yeah, it's one of the one of the islands off the coast of California. You you get there from San Diego and take a plane from San Diego over. To I see. Okay, Island. cool. Um, and then I have also um, I I got to do some work in Mexico in Baja Sur uh, specifically um, at a site called Piedra Pintada, um, and so it's uh, it's a prehistoric site. Um, uh, 5,000 or so year, years ago, rock art, rock shelter, um, just up in, up in the mountains, um, pretty far from, from civilization. And I got to work with a, a, a team of archaeologists, both from um, the United States and Mexico. And so that was, that was a fun one. Um, here in the Midwest, there, one of the sites that I got to do a little bit of work on um, is a site called Nicodemus in Kansas and it's in the far um, kind of Northwest corner of Kansas. And it is the site of the oldest continuously occupied free black community. It was established after the civil war in Kansas specifically. Um, And uh, it's not, 
it's not a, a site where you find a lot of really flashy artifacts, but the, the history of it um, is, is pretty amazing. Um, and along with that too, another site in uh, Bates County, Missouri, which is where I do the bulk of my work now, um, is a site called the Battle of Island Mound site. And it actually was the very first engagement of um, African Americans in the Civil War. This is prior to the Emancipation Proclamation of the Kansas um, State Militia um, Group. Um, and so I was, I had the honor of helping to interpret that site for Missouri's uh, newest state historic site um, a few years ago. So lots of really fascinating stuff everywhere. Yeah, sure. Sounds like it. You know, you got to move around a little bit, California, Mexico, now uh, in the Midwest. And and I and for my next question, I kind of want to dial things in a little bit more yet again. And and yeah, sometimes these really can be loaded questions because we've had, <laughs> we get the opportunity to work in so many amazing places and we find a lot of uh, amazing things along the way too. But as far as like artifacts is concerned, is there any particular artifact that comes to mind that I guess I'll say would be like, I guess the coolest artifact <laughs> that you've right. ever recovered? <laughs> The, the most common and most dreaded question of archaeologists, right? Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, people always kind of look disappointed when I talk about it because they expect, you know, some kind of, I don't know, ink and mask or, or something when some people do find those, and that's awesome. Um, the sites that I work with um, tend not to be super flashy things. And so the, a lot of the, the cool artifacts that I find are things that to me really demonstrate that real personal link um, or that just required um, some extra detective work to figure out what the heck is this thing. So two of them come to mind, um, both of them from my work in, in Bates County, uh, which is on Civil War era sites. Um, one of them was a, um, a gun wedge from a um, 1854 Colt pattern revolver, and it's a little metal piece, and this one looked like it had been handcrafted, but um, it's a little metal piece that fits into a slot and basically holds the two pieces of the gun together, you know, the barrel and the handle, and so you kind of push a spring down and pull that out so you could take the gun apart to, to clean it, but if you lose that, then you've just got, like, <laughs> you know, you could throw a couple of pieces of the gun at somebody and, um, but that particular gun is, uh, was used in a very limited phase, and so it's an excellent time marker. I mean, I can't use radiocarbon dating because my stuff is too new, right? And so I, I need other kinds of time markers to help me. And so with historic sites, the narrower you can put that range down, um, the better. Right. Um, so finding that very specific little piece, it, had, it has such a little story to it too. Like, you know, what happened? They lost this. Obviously they lost one before they had to make a new one and then they lost this one. So, um, but then the other piece was a, it looked like a barrette, kind of a long, narrow barrette, um, but it wasn't flexible. It was clearly made of brass. Um, and I kept finding several of them in kind of varied sizes. And I'm like, what the, what the heck is this thing? I have no idea what it is. And so go out to the glory of the internet, historical archaeology, you know, news groups and, and such. And I put it out there. And it turns out they were reeds from a concertina, which is like a little handheld accordion where the buttons are on the side instead of the front. So kind of a squeeze box that you push in and out. And these go around the outer edge. Um, where the paper goes through to kind of create the different notes. Uh, so that's why you have the different different lengths. But it was this whole journey of trying to figure out what this is. Um, but then when you find that out, not only is it cool just to finally get the answer, but now you have this picture of this musical family, right? You know, sitting around in the house and playing music together. Um, so it takes it from kind of a, a practical answer to a real kind of personal story. Um, and those are the, those are the kinds of things that I really like. 
All right. Very, very interesting. You, you had me thinking all of a sudden when you talked about finding this revolver wedge, I'm thinking, man, it must have been a really bad day for that soldier to lose the wedge of his sidearm. And suddenly now he has this revolver that's basically useless. I mean, that's got to be a frightening feeling. <laughs> so, <laughs> And we also found the, the, the trigger screw for that exact same gun in a different season in a different pit. So something happened with that gun. And, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it, 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 and that's like one of the things that's uh, always um, nice. You know, you're talking about doing a little bit of extra detective work and some of that just kind of comes with like, you know, your own thought process and thinking and trying to put yourself uh, back into the past a little bit and think, you know, what was it like for someone who had this artifact or in this case lost this critical component to something that right. was very useful to them in this in that right. situation, but then suddenly they, they don't have it. <laughs> right. And these guns were not cheap. I mean, they were not, uh, yeah. All right. Very interesting. All right. Well, um, I want to shift gears a little bit and I want to talk a little bit about mentorship. Um, of course, the role of mentor is something that you're uh, doing right now with being a professor, but who has been your mentor or maybe even had a couple of mentors along the way and how have they influenced yeah. you throughout your career? Yeah. Um, I think, I, you know, there are several really. Um, one of the one of the first ones I would say would be my um, thesis advisor at Cal State Northridge, Dr. Antonio Gilman, uh, one of the most brilliant people I've ever known, um, and uh, you know he very high expectations, very demanding, um, but more than happy to to help you. And and I think one of the things that really always influenced me with him was his just his intellectual not just prowess, but his, his honesty. He didn't care if he agreed with your theoretical position, your conclusions. He just cared whether or not you could make a, a logical argument for it. Um, and that's what he would, would focus on. And so um, one of the best classes I ever took um, in my graduate um, education career was was his social organization class, and it used Bruce Trigger's The History of Archaeological Thought text. And if you've ever read that, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a slog to get through, but, but really <clears throat> full of important information. But in that class, he had us do two papers. Um, he had a list of paper topics. We picked the topic. Once we picked the two topics, he gave us the bibliography for each paper, uh, which consisted of 30 sources. We had to write a 10 to 12 page paper and we had to track down all 30 of those sources and use all 30 of them in those 10 to 12 pages. Wow. Um, and this was in the day before, you know, the internet wasn't, wasn't as helpful and robust as it is now. Right. right? So, you know, I, I would have to drive to various university libraries in, you know, in the Valley in LA and wander through the stacks um, and he knew which ones were hard to find and which ones weren't. Um, and if you called him and said, I can't find this one and you could, he'd say, you can leave me alone. You know, um, I had to call him for one source cause I couldn't find it. He's like, okay, yeah, that's hard to find. I have a copy of it. I'll give it to you. Right. But I had to go through the process <laughs> of trying to find it first. It put you through a and trial. <laughs> it, it was, it really was. And then we had to read each of these papers in class. He timed us because they were supposed to be like conference paper length. <laughs> presentations and if you exceeded your 20 minutes he would just stop you and you were done <clears throat> excuse me um so it was probably the most rigorous and helpful academic exercise that i went through as a graduate student hands down right wow um so and yeah he was just a it still is a, a, a wonderful wonderful person um my late husband mark rob was also a um a huge mentor for me in, in many ways. He actually was a professor at, at Cal State Northridge when I met him. Um, and then later we worked together in, in Mexico. And then through my um, career, um, he was always very supportive and, and helpful. And, um, and then, you know, of course, you get into your PhD program. Um, and my dissertation advisor, John, John Hopes, um, you know, he took me on as a PhD student at KU, even though nobody there does or was doing any of the archaeology that I do, really. Um, and for my PhD data collection, I 
started from scratch and ran a field school for several years. Um, and he's like, okay, sure, you should do that. You know, <laughs> is that what you want? Knock yourself out, right? Um, and then two others, um, Stanley South, um, so the kind of preeminent historical art, he's like the Lou Benford of historical archaeology. Um, I based a lot of my work on, on his um, work that he did, his you know, pioneering theoretical positions. And we kind of became pen pals um, toward the end of his life when I was working on that. And so he was very supportive. Um, and then another person that you've interviewed, actually, Doug Scott. Um, he is an amazing individual, um, not just archaeologist, but person. And I got to work with him um, as part of a, a, a TV show that was on uh, PBS called America from the Ground Up. And I was in um, a couple of episodes where he was kind of the talking head expert that season, kind of the through line. Um, so I got to work with him one day and we've since become uh, friends. And he's just extremely supportive. Um, he's a great kind of intellectual um, to talk to and get advice from. And so he kind of is, continues to be a good friend and mentor to this day. All right. Outstanding. It, it always is really nice to have, uh, you know, those, those mentors uh, along the way, because let's face it, this yeah. can be a, this can be a pretty challenging uh, career field. And especially mm -hmm. early, um, as like uh, early on in our careers too, it sometimes takes a little bit to get a good foothold, you know, to find like a more, I guess I'll say stable job within this, this profession. So <laughs> right. having, right. having those mentors along the way to kind of help you get your footing to move forward is always very beneficial. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. All right. So what I, um, the next question I want to ask you, and this is kind of shifting gears, uh, yet again, um, you know, you mentioned you had a little bit of exposure with working in a different country, working in Mexico, but what, what country out there do you think kind of handles archeology span and cultural, cultural resource management the best? Like, who do you think just gets it? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Um, that's an interesting one. I, I mean, my, I don't have a, a real depth of experience in like CRM, archaeology. I have some, I mean, my, my late husband did a lot of it. And so most of what I was exposed to was just hearing about him and his, his work that he did. But I have been exposed to it a little bit um, in, in Missouri, just with some colleagues as well. Um, you know, every country has some things that they do right and, and, and could do better. I like in, in, in Mexico and what I know of the UK, I like the kind of communal sense of ownership of the past. I think that contributes to some, some good preservation. Um, it's more tricky, of course, in the United States because it's not just, you know, us, of course. Um, we came into a place that was already occupied and so there's other dynamics involved. Right. I think that what we do well um, in the United States is we have, we do have a good series of, of laws on a federal level. And I think that the states that also have a robust set of complementary state laws um, also do, do very well. Um, California, of course, has a, a very robust set of, of those laws and in, in the Southeast and, and other areas they, they also do. Um, in the Midwest, like in Missouri, for instance, we have an unmarked burial law at the state level and it's kind of about it. <laughs> um, mm. And so everything redounds to the federal uh, laws and then, you know, the feds rely on the state folks to say, yes, we're complying with the federal laws. And, and so I think a lot more things get lost um, in those states. And so that, that disconnect, I think, is where we have a lot of work to do. Um, but I think we have the right idea and good places to start and some good models to go with. Right. Yeah. Well, hopefully we just keep on moving forward and we kind of sort of bridge <laughs> that uh, gap, if you will. So absolutely. Indeed. All right. Well, now what I want to ask you about next is uh, volunteers. You know, I think volunteers also play a very critical component into a lot of the work that we do as archaeologists. Now, do you have any um, volunteers in there at Longview or I guess within like uh, Bates, any of the work you do within Bates County or anything like that? 
Um, yes, I do. And it kind of depends on, on the project. If it's a, like if it's a field school that I'm running, um, that limits me on the number of other volunteers that I can, I can use. It has to be, you know, students who's enrolled and there's liability issues and all that stuff. Sure. Yeah. Um, but I am able sometimes to go out and just kind of do work um, that I want to, that's not a field school. And in those cases, yes, I do. Um, sometimes it's students who I have worked with before, um, who I know I don't need to com- completely monitor. They can come in and, and, and do the work. Um, and then sometimes it, it is other students or just people in the community um, who are interested. And in, in, um, I usually limit the number just so that I can properly you know, manage and teach and guide and all of that stuff. But, but yes, I, I love to be able to, to incorporate volunteers into it when I can. All right. Outstanding. All right. Well, the next couple of questions that I have for you, this is getting to what I say is the core of what it means to be an archaeologist. <laughs> and the first of those questions is what is just the best part about being an archaeologist? <laughs> I get to dig stuff up, right. You know? Um, yeah. I, the best part to me and the part that I get to spend the least amount of my time on, um, which I think is true for a lot of archaeologists, especially in the academic world, is going out and doing those excavations and, um, you know, doing, doing what you got into it um, to, to begin with. Um, but, but I also love <clears throat> the inherent interdisciplinary nature of archaeology. You know, um, and anthropology as a whole, I think, is it's true of that as well. I always tell my students that you could, whatever your career choice is, if you put the word anthropology at the end of it, like it works, right? Because, you know, it's, it involves human beings. And I think with archaeology, too, there's so many ways to incorporate um, other disciplines. And, um, and to me, that's just fascinating, learning, learning new ways that you know, I don't know, chemistry and archaeology or history and archaeology or biology and, you know, all of those geology, they intersect um, and just make it um, kind of fill in that picture that we're trying to, to illustrate as archaeologists. You add those other pieces to it and you end up with this, you know, brilliant watercolor uh, rather than a sketch. And it's, um, I just love that the nerd in me. It's just, I just like, I love it. I love that part. All right. Awesome. And, and actually, I think that's probably a first to come up on the podcast, Dr. Rob, oh. to kind of like describe uh, archaeology in this more holistic sense, because you're absolutely <laughs> right. There, there's, there's a lot that really kind of like uh, co- comes into this, you know, yeah, a, a little bit, a little bit of uh, history, a little bit of this and a little bit of uh, that. And even with mm-hmm. me having a military background, I'm constantly tying things from my military experience uh, yeah. into my work and things like that though too. So, all right, very good. But mm-hmm. on the flip side though, <laughs> what would you say is the worst part about being an archeologist? Oh man, the worst part, um, not getting to do enough archeology. span <laughs> That would be part of it. Um, and, and I think just, uh, I don't know if it's the, the worst part, and, if, you know, I've heard people talking about some of the drudgery in the field. And, yes, that, that can be, um, you know, the, um, the bugs and the poison ivy. I had the summer of poison ivy that I wish to never repeat. Um, Same and, here. <laughs> those yep. kinds of yep, things. Yep. So those can be. Um, but for me, the, one of the frustrating parts about it is constantly fighting against the misperceptions of archaeology. You know, and the the sometimes glorified and supported misperceptions. You know, the idea that it's treasure hunting. You know, that we should go that it's all about the artifacts. That that's like the end goal of archaeology. Um, that you can just go dig up anything, and it doesn't matter um, what harm does it do, right? And so you you know, I'm constantly fighting against those misperceptions for what is a, a you know a vanishing resource. Um, and I think that to me, that, that sometimes leaves me feeling a little bit defeated um, and, and pessimistic sometimes. But um, so I think for me, that's probably the worst part. Right. It's, it's a tough dichotomy, isn't it? Because on one hand, yes, we kind of want to maybe 
lean on to, uh, to like the romantic side of the profession a little bit because mm-hmm. that certainly can cultivate that public interest or maybe even right. get like other people interested in maybe becoming archaeologists uh, themselves but at the same mm-hmm. time we don't want to totally neglect the actual scientific component right. <laughs> and the discipline of what it is that we actually do so but of course if we go too far on that side then we can just lose the interest of the public and you know that you know might not work out so well either so finding like a good right. balance between the two <laughs> which is hard to come by I, I certainly agree with you yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay. So uh, the next question that I have for you, this is a tribute to The Right Stuff, which is a wonderful mm-hmm. novel written by Tom Wolfe. I would like to know who is the greatest archaeologist that you have ever seen? Hmm. Well, there's, there's two ways I can answer that question. One could be the greatest archaeologist, meaning kind of the most famous, most prominent archaeologist I've ever seen. Mm. Um, and that would be probably when I got to meet Lou Benford um, and at a conference in uh, Missouri, of all places. Um, his wife, Amber Johnson, is working at Truman State University in Kirksville, Missouri. And so they came to the Missouri Archaeological Society um, meeting. Interesting, brief little side note. Um, I was a PhD student. I was giving a conference paper at this um, smaller statewide conference, um, Missouri Archaeological Society. And it was um, a paper on measuring the thickness of window glass to date historic structures in the 19th century. So like real thrilling stuff, right? Um, And it was at 8 a.m. And I go up there to give my paper and literally right before I start in walks Lou Binford to come and sit down and listen to my 8 a.m. paper about window glass thickness. And it was like, this is like every grad student's nightmare. (laughs) (laughs) Dream dream slash nightmare. (laughs) Dream slash nightmare. Um, But he was very gracious, very kind. Um, And so I actually got to sit uh, next to him at the the dinner that evening and listen to him tell stories about his time in Africa, in that Africa, sorry, Alaska, the other A, um, in Alaska. Um, But in the other interpretation of that question, like the greatest, most accomplished archaeologist I've ever seen, and I know I'm partial, but I think a lot of people who knew him would agree, would have to be my late husband, um, Mark Robb. There was nothing he could not do in the field. Um, If he didn't have it, he could build it. Um, If he didn't know what he needed, he could invent it. Um, he um, He could excavate perfectly faster than anybody I've ever known. Um, We do field schools to train students, but it's like, all right, it's the end of the day. We need to get down to the bottom of the level. All right, Mark, come in and, you know, 15 (laughs) minutes and he's got it like perfect walls and, you know. Um, Also, uh, you know, an extremely accomplished um, scholar and professor. And I mean, if you're going to pick an absolute all around archeologist, he was the greatest I'd ever seen. Outstanding. Very good. All right. Well, the next couple questions that I have for you, these are questions that I'm sure all archaeologists have been <laughs> asked at one point in time, and we've kind of alluded to this a little bit earlier on in our conversation. And the first of those questions is, have you ever found a dinosaur? I have not found a dinosaur. Um, I've had a couple of people like contact me because they're convinced that they found a dinosaur bone on their property. Um, and it's always a dinosaur vacuum. I don't know why. Um, if you don't know what that is, you can look it up. Um, <laughs> it's, um, we're going to keep this PG, but, um, but yes, that's, that's as close as I've come. Gotcha. And the next question that goes along the same lines, and that is, uh, how do you feel about Indiana Jones? I love Indiana Jones. Right. I mean, I was just the right age when the movie came out. I thought it was just one of the best movies I'd ever seen. Absolutely thrilling. He's a terrible archaeologist. <laughs> I mean, he destroys everything in his path. Right. right. Um, you know, everything wrong about archaeology historically is kind of summed up in his in his character. Um, all the lessons we kind of had to learn the the hard way about what to do and what what not to do. Um, but, I mean, he really is an icon and, and got a lot of people really interested in, in archaeology. So for that, um, I love him. And then I can also use him as a, 
as a recognizable example of what not to do. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, it's that's enjoyable a, and helpful. <laughs> yeah, I, I haven't thought about it that way. It's like he's going to all of these uh, places in the pursuit of archaeology, but he's just like always getting in a fight, like along the like yeah. at every step of the way, and is just messing up yeah. everything along the way too. All the context is just <laughs> going to collapse, things exploding, like it's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> worst ever yeah absolutely all right well i got a couple more questions for you uh dr sure. rob and we're going to kind of start wrapping up on a little bit more of a serious note now mm -hmm. i would like to ask you what advice would you give to young people or just maybe even anyone uh for that matter because as we mentioned it's never too late for someone to pursue this career field but what sure. advice would you give to someone who's looking to make a career in archaeology um well, I think it, several people um, on your podcast I've heard mention, you know, knowing how to write well. I think that's, that's you know, definitely an, an important thing. Absolutely. Um, never stop um, learning about it and reading about it. I mean, keep up to date on all kinds of new um, information, uh, even if you're not formally studying. I mean, that's what I did for a decade before I finally got back into it and it actually helped me quite a bit um, to be able to jump jump into it um, at that point. Um, but a couple of other things that I would say is certainly um, network. Um, don't be afraid to talk to um, other people uh, about it, even, you know, quote unquote, really famous archeologists, you know, um, Kind of when we were chatting before this podcast started, archaeologists are people too, right? And, right. And um, the very first time that I met um, Doug Scott for that that PBS show, he had done some work, preliminary work, survey work on the Battle of Island Mound site. And we were trying to one of the big questions was trying to locate where a structure had been. And there were a couple of possibilities. <clears throat> and the group that he worked with had kind of zeroed in on one of the two locations as the what they thought was the strongest possibility. Um, and then we came in and did the ground truth thing. And the, our report to the state actually pointed to the other um, location as, uh, as the possibility. And so here I am meeting Doug Scott, Scott, one of the most famous archeologists in the world who I have now contradicted in a report, right? And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, did he read this report? Is he going to be mad at me, right? Um, and, uh, so when I met him, I, I was like, well, did you read the report? And he's like, oh, yeah. Oh, I thought, like, you guys did, did the archaeology. I thought your um, reasoning was sound. We just did the survey. You know, I agree with you. I thought you, you had a, you know, I was like, wow, you know, it's very, um, you know, gracious. But, um, you know, it just shows that he's, he's a, a person who's interested in getting to the answer as much as anybody else, right? Um, right. It's not, not about his status. And so... You know, don't be afraid to, to talk to those. Um, and then, you know, don't, don't be intimidated. Like, go to conferences, um, even, as a, even as an undergrad um, or a master's student, and give papers. Um, work with, cultivate your, your contacts within faculty. You're going to need those recommendations, right, to go to grad school. Um, that's one of the things that I really find with a lot of my students uh, everywhere I've taught is they have a lack of, of cultivated relationships with faculty that, that they've worked with. Um, and, and like I said, don't, don't be intimidated. I mean, the very first time that I went to the Society for American Archaeology conference, huge conference, right? And I was a master student and I was giving a paper um, on some theory something. I don't even remember what I was on, a basic little theory paper. And I've been teaching, you know, been a corporate trainer for a decade. I'd done improv for over a decade. Like I had no problem being in front of people, right? Right. Um, but I was so intimidated in this new environment with all of these other academics, you know, who I assumed just knew way more than me. Um, and so because of that, I actually typed out my paper like I did in Antonio Gilman's class, right? I typed out my whole paper and read it rather than kind of riffing off my PowerPoint slides. Um, and my chair for the session was Bill Andrewski, who's like a very famous lithic, you know, expert. And he was super kind. Um, 
And I was just abjectly terrified to give this paper to this crowd. Um, but then after sitting there and watching other people give their papers, I was like, oh, well, I can, like, I can do this, right? And I went up and I read my paper and it was just deathly. Um, and I learned at that moment, it's like, you know what? I may not know as much as everybody else here, but I know more about what I'm talking about right now than anybody else in the room. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you're doing your research, I think that's, even if it's a, even if it's a tiny little piece, you're the expert on that tiny little piece. So don't sell yourself short on being that, that expert in that second right there. Um, and give yourself the permission to, to be that expert. Right. Absolutely. And, you know, those are some really good points. And if I may add to that as well, also just, you know, you, you brought up the point that, you know, this is going to be a lifelong journey of learning and, and exploration. And sometimes it even just takes being humble enough to admit that you don't know everything. And, and then it becomes a matter right. of asking questions, you know, when you're networking with people, like even with me doing this podcast, uh, and and I'll admit, and then, you know, maybe this might make me sound, this puts me a little bit more of a vulnerable spot, I mean, being, a, <laughs> being having a master's degree in archaeology and everything. But it's just, you know, when you uh, told me about your specialty that you, you study the Kansas, Missouri border wars, and also a general order number 11, my knowledge of those, like, when I read that, I'm like, I, I knew nothing pretty practically. Right. So I actually had to take to Google before getting on uh, here. And then when I was talking with uh, Dr. Kinkella recently, I had to tell him right at the beginning of the podcast, I know very little about Mayan <laughs> archaeology. So you're probably gonna have to carry me through this interview. But I'm right. but but it just put yourself in that mindset to where, you know, you're open to the new information and you're open to what other people have to share about things that they know and you kind of add it to your own toolbox. So those right. are some really good points and I appreciate those. Yeah. And that's that one of the great things about going to these conferences and, and networking. Um, with people is you find these commonalities, you know, you kind of, you create this question and you're researching things. And, um, you know, I've been doing my work in, in Bates County for years and on order number 11 and the border war. And I'm thinking, wow, this kind of, um, you know, guerrilla type warfare that was going on is a great, you know, kind of corollary to a lot of the insurgency that's happening in the modern world. And so it's a really great connection to things that are happening today in addition just to being a fascinating tidbit from the past. Um, and then in meeting up with Doug Scott, for instance, you know, I, I mean, his interest in the Trans-Mississippi kind of aspect of, of the Civil War is, is exactly the same. Um, and there are a lot of other people out there who have similar interests coming at it from all of these different points. And so being able to find that other piece, and it's like, oh, if I can take that, we can join these forces together. It's like Wonder Twins, power, activate, that'll date me. Right. No Wonder Twins, but um, <laughs> <laughs> it just helps you. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, I got one final question for you, Dr. Rob, and we're going to sure. kind of, and this is a pretty big one too, this uh, final question here. And that is, what can the general public do to help protect archaeological sites? This is actually one of the things that I work with here in Missouri a lot. Um, just because it is mostly up to the general public to protect sites. Um, right. Educate yourself uh, about your local history. Um, when people, and I, I always ask my, question, my students this question at the beginning of the classes, it's like when you think of archaeology, like what kinds of sites and what locations do you think of first? Right. And it's always, oh, Egypt or you yeah, know, somewhere you know, far away, basically. Somewhere far away. Right. Um, and they don't bother to think about the dirt that's literally under their feet right there. And I have students in my classes from Bates County. Um, and when I get to the part of the class where I talk about my own work, because if you're a college professor, archaeologist, you know, you got to talk about your own work. Right. Um, so I talk about my work in Bates County and they're like, I never knew any of this. And I live there. Right. Um, and so I think that the first thing, first thing that you can do um, is become more invested in your in your local history. Um, get involved with your local historical society, with your um, local or state chapter of archaeological society. Right. Um, learn where um, the sites are. Learn how archaeology works. Um, learn what to do and what not to do um, so that you 
um, don't needlessly destroy sites in an, and I think an honest pursuit for um, trying to uncover history. I think most people really just, you know, are excited about the history. Um, but, you know, learning good techniques um, and in the areas where it's possible, um, learn to record sites. Um, I think that's a, that's a critical part of it that gets overlooked often is, you know, if, if nothing's recorded there, I don't care how much people try to adhere to section 106 and come in and, you know, do the research. And if they don't see that there's anything recorded there, it's really easy to just kind of pass it over and say, well, we don't think that there's anything here. All right. So um, I think if you do those things, cause there's only so many of us archeologists, right? We can't, right. can't do everything. We can't, excavate everything, um, trying to convince people that sometimes not excavating is the best choice <laughs> is, is hard. Um, but yeah, get invested in your, in, in your local history. Um, cause there's a ton there. There's so much there that's fascinating and boy, your local historical societies need your help. Yeah, really absolutely. absolutely. All right. Very good. All right. Well, Dr. Rob, that's it. That's all uh, 15 questions uh, wrapped up here. But before we uh, close out, um, is there any way um, our listeners can reach out and connect with you? I believe um, maybe like your Bates County uh, work, I think is out there in the internet space uh, a little bit. Um, where can we find um, and learn more about that? Um, yeah, I actually have um, a Facebook page for those who still do Facebook, um, <laughs> but it's uh, Bates County, Missouri archaeology um, is the, is the Facebook page. And so um, that's probably the the best way right now. When I have field work, I post pictures and videos and notices and um, and other things. And there's archived stuff that they could that they could look at. Um, so so yeah. Okay, and I'll get that linked up uh, in the show notes so listeners can go and find them there. All right. Well, well, Dr. Rob, I want to thank you very much for taking the time for joining me today. Um, you know, again, it's always just. For me personally, it's always really nice, again, just to interact with archaeologists who are operating in so many uh, different areas of the world. I just feel like I learned so much, you know, from <laughs> these conversations. And I know our listeners uh, probably really enjoyed uh, this as well. And so just thank you very much for just being here and, you know, giving your insight to myself and the listeners. You know, it's been outstanding. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Absolutely. All right, everyone, that's our show for today. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at NPSCAC. That is at NPSSEAC. And be on the lookout for more episodes of 15 Questions with an Archaeologist dropping at the first of every single month. And please remember that since we work for the government, we spell archaeology without the A and the E, so it's a little bit different when you read it in the title. Thanks so much for tuning in today. I'm Josh Guerrero, and I'll see you in the next episode.